Okay, well, welcome everyone. I'm Andrea Grover, I'm the Executive Director of Guild Hall, and this is going to be a tour of Karen Weissman's system. A uh, tour of Karen Weissman's studio with our Chief Curator and Museum Director, Christina Strassfield. First, I wanted to introduce a few of my colleagues from Guild Hall. So we have Lita Mumgard, who is the uh, manager of our membership department. And we also have Kristen Eberstad, who is our director of philanthropy. Um, and I want to introduce my chairman, Marty Cohen, if you could just give a wave. For all of those chairman circle members who are in attendance, welcome. Also welcome to the director circle and also the contemporary circle. So um, I wanted to let you know that you would probably have a better viewing experience if you switched your view to speaker view. And that's in the top right corner of your screen. Also that you can post questions during the studio tour in the chat box and then Lita will read those at the end of the tour. Um, so Karen will be having an exhibition next year in 2021 uh, called The Horizon is Not a Straight Line. Uh, that was meant to be in 2020, but for obvious reasons was postponed until next year. Very excited to have her work in the museum. It is actually currently in the museum as part of All for the Hall, which is a benefit exhibition that was spearheaded and organized by Robert Longo when his own exhibition was postponed also to 2021. Um, and Christina Strassfield is curating that one as well. So Karen's work is appearing in an, a brand new exhibition space that we've carved out, not a physical space, but a timeline space for artists who are really pushing aesthetic experimentation and artists who are part of our community. And um, Enoch Perez will be also exhibiting during the same period of time next year in April, 2021. So um, I think that's everything that I need to say in forms of uh, welcoming and housekeeping. Just remember to please post questions as we go along in the chat box because it makes for a very uh, rich discussion. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Christina Strathfield. Uh, thank you, Andrea. We're extremely lucky to have this opportunity to visit with Karen Weissman in her studio. I always feel that when an artist is willing to let us into their studio, it's like they're sharing their inner sanctum. As was mentioned, we were supposed to have Karen's exhibition, The Horizon is Not a Straight Line, this past May, but because of the pandemic, it has been postponed to April 24th through May 31st, 2021. Just a little background information on Karen before we begin. Karen is an Argentinian-born multimedia artist who creates drawings, sculptures, and installations. Karen lives and works in New York City and Bridgehampton. She has completed commissions for public places and institutions in Mexico at the Museum del Barrio, New York, the Plattsburgh Sculpture Park in SUNY Plattsburgh, the Ommis Sculpture Park in Ghent, New York, Socrates Sculpture Park in Long Island City, New York. Her work has been exhibited in galleries and museums in the United States, including the Parish Art Museum, the Museum del Barrio, the Sculpture Center in Long Island City, the Newhoff Gallery, the Heim Chining Fine Arts, Plattsburgh State Art Museum, the Hartel Gallery, Cornell University, and in Hamburg, Germany, Mexico City, and Argentina. Karen's Guildhall exhibition explores nature and its elements. She will debut a site-specific cast resin ceramic wall installation, drawings, and a bronze floor sculpture, which we'll get a sneak preview at today. Karen wrote a beautiful artist statement, which I'd like to read before turning it over to her. She states, we are immersed in the subtle rhythm of nature, from the feeling of our bodies submerged in water, different depths, currents, and temperatures, lighter closer to the surface, darker when we dive to the bottom, the marking of a pencil on the paper, echoing the moving and pulsating ocean, nothing is still. Looking up, we see the rocks and the mountains. We feel the pull of the void, absolute and determined by emptiness. Inevitably, we think of time, the hundreds of years of erosion, the cavities that hold humidity and debris. They have been there before us and they will be there after we leave. 
perceiving the horizon not as a line, but as a complex border, a moment of contact between two elements that push and pull while holding each other. A soft sound touches the surface and continues to move. The wall breathes and captures the light. We move parallel to that wall, and if we pay close attention, we can hear the breathing in and out and a gentle rhythm without end. I just thought that was so beautiful, uh, Karen. So uh, without further ado, we're so delighted to welcome Karen and to thank Karen for allowing us to be in her studio and um, to throw it over to her because Karen has, present, has a wonderful presentation for us where she's going to walk us through some of her earlier work and transition us to some of the work that she is doing now and the work that's going to be in our Guild Hall exhibition. So Karen. Thank you, Christina, and thank you, Andrea, and everybody who are joining us for this uh, studio visit. Uh, usually I split my time between my studio in New York and my studio in Long Island. But this year, because of uh, my show at the Hall, I, was, I spent most of the winter in Long Island. So uh, when March and the pandemic started, I was here and basically I've been here since the winter. Uh, I want to start showing, I'm going to, to show some things in the computer and then we are going to start the walkthrough in the studio. First, I want to show a short video, two minutes long that um, the Parish Museum asked me to do, to show what was going on in my studio during the pandemic. So I'm going to start with that. Hi, I'm Karen Weisman, and this is my studio in Bridgehampton. I have been here since the beginning of March with my family, and it's my ninth week in quarantine. At this time, part of my work should have been in a museum show that was postponed for April and May of 2021. So in March, I had to change gears and go from the energy needed to install a show in a museum to a more introspective routine of working alone in my studio. My work explores our perception of the world around us its fluid process of growth, and the threat of disorder. During the past two months and a half, it has been comforting to be close to nature and to observe its repeated cycles of change, from winter to spring and interrupted, to see the light change from white and sharp in early March to a warm, soft, and green light now in May. I'm working on previously started pieces that were on hold or unfinished, some from last year and some started many years ago. At the beginning of the pandemic, it was really hard for me to have the concentration necessary to start new work. So finishing already started work was a way to continue a familiar conversation a way to find some sort of provisional coherence. Okay, so um, this is uh, the last piece that we saw in the video and it's going to be part of the show at the hall. It's, I wanted to include it because uh, it's, even though it was done in 1996, cast in that year, uh, it contains many of the ideas that will be present in my work starting at that point to the present. Uh, so this is uh, the name of this piece is Siren Speech and it's made out of 110 separate pieces cast in aluminum and here we can see for instance one of the elements that is going to be present in my work is the importance of the fragment and the possibility of infinite growth, like that fragment expanding. And also we can see the tension between that fragment. Here we can see the fragments, like a close up. And all the pieces are, are numbered. 
And if you see, this is an image from above, you can see the importance of the border. This is a square and it really works as a container, uh, a shield that would contain kind of a thread of disorder. So this piece could be installed in many different ways, like the space in between the pieces could uh, be wider or narrower. It could be completed as it is, or it could be all spread on the floor. So going back to my studio, um, this is an image from this winter and um, I wanted you to see it because now when we do the walkthrough in my studio, it's dark and I wanted to see, I wanted to show how important light is in my practice uh, and how light changes during the year. So this is a very white crisp light that I get in my studio in the winter. And here is, I would say in the afternoon uh, with a slightly softer light. And I wanted to show this, um, this image so you could see different pieces in different stages of completion. Uh, in the one on the, on the left, we can see the pattern and the idea of a pattern that could start expanding. And the one on the right, it's a little bit more advanced in the process and you can already start reading the, the border of the piece. Um, so I like to work in pairs usually, even though these are separate pieces and it's very important for me the dialogue between the two pieces when I work. I usually start the piece on the floor um, and it's a, it has many steps. It goes from the floor to the wall, from the wall to the floor and so on. So this is the piece that was on the left that we saw before on the left. And here again, we have that piece that part will already hang and you can see the difference between the overall pattern that it's these pieces and the more ornamental part. So these pieces are thinner and they are cast in, in a material that is called Forton, that it's a mix of hydrocarbon and resin and these pieces are made in clay. So here we have again the same piece like a little bit more advanced in the process and different light again, but still we have that white light from winter or early spring. And we can see the one on the, on the left that it's, it's more advanced. Also, I want to show, like emphasize the importance of the wall. Like the wall is not a, a surface where I work, it's, it's really part of the piece. And here I have a video that I want to show so you can see the process of uh, installation. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Oh, no, there it is. So first I'm, I'm, I'm uh, installing the template and it's very important the location of the template as once the piece is installed, it's not that easy to move. And so here the template is installed I, and, and I'm starting to, to hang up the wall, the, the pieces on the wall. This is the overall pattern first. And then I'm starting to install the ceramic pieces. And once I get to half, usually half of the piece, I need to start removing the template. So the template is, is done in very thin paper. So I'm going, you are going to see how the paper is ripped off. Like I need to remove some pieces, rip off the paper, hang it again, rip off the paper, hang it again. And 
So that's the process of, of, of how the, the installation um, is. It's like, if you see, it's a series of very coordinated steps that, uh, that are repeated every time I need to install a piece. It's almost like a choreography that needs to be repeated every time that I, I, I install the piece. So the piece is almost done now. Okay, and so here we have some of the fragments uh, I was showing when I was doing the other two tondos. So these pieces are done in clay. Usually it's, it's I don't follow any pattern, but sometimes I do need to follow, I want a very specific piece for a specific place. So I, I do some sketches and, and, and then I do the pieces in clay. This is for a, for a different piece. It's a little bit more representational. It's, it's always a tension between representation and abstraction in these pieces. And here we have an image of the pieces uh, the clay pieces, I work with a ceramist who fires the work for me. So I was at her studio setting up the pieces so she could, uh, they could finish the drying process and then they could be fired. And these are the clay pieces for the, for the bigger, for the horizon is not a straight line that I'm going to show at Guild Hall in April and May uh, when they were still being dry. This is the clay being dry in my studio. And these are the pieces already fired uh, when they came back from the ceramics. So usually I lay everything on the floor and I start looking for the connections or the language that I need for, for each piece. And this is an image of the beginning of that piece, that piece that uh, Christina mentioned that it's 250 inches long. Um, it's, we can see the two main elements, the, the overall pattern and the, the bottom part that it's the, the more open uh, dynamic part of the piece. Uh, this part. So this is at the very beginning and it's, it, it went through many transformations, but I want you to see here the overall pattern and how these fragments start growing, you know, and the, that idea of organic growth and the importance of the border. Here it's more advanced. And the bottom part also, it's coming, it's more it's stronger. And this is uh, at a different stage, it's a little bit more advanced. So um, I think at this moment, we can start seeing these pieces in the studio. This is kind of an overall of that piece. It's very different at this time of the day that when you saw it, and I'm going to start like showing it a little bit closer since it doesn't fit. And I'm going to go closer to the piece so you can see some of the details. You can see the marks of my fingers while I was working on the clay. It's, it's very different than these pieces that are cast. So the upper part is cast in Forton, the same material that I sh was mentioning before, and the lower part is made in clay, uh, in ceramics. So in this piece, the tension that we saw in the other pieces between the circle and the expansion of the pattern is it's in the surface between these two elements. Um, like we can feel the push and pull and the, how each surface needs, needs the other in order to exist. So 
So if we see here, we have the two tondos that we saw from the beginning. So the, the one on the left is the one that had the overall pattern growing on the wall. And the one on the right was very different, if you remember from those images. And this is the piece I'm working now. Uh, this, uh, I started really after the pandemic. They were part of two different pieces and I just, I work and I tried to solve them and there was, it was not working. So finally I, I had them very close on the floor and I thought they could work together well. So I'm in the process of developing this. And this piece, everything is made in ceramic. Here we can see that some of the patterns are have references to nature, to, to gardens or to uh, plants, even though if they are close, if they are a little bit abstract, but, but that's the beginning. And here I have, I want to show you this tile. This is an eight inch by eight, eight inch um, encaustic tile that I made for a project uh, in Mexico in the Chihuahua Desert. So I want, I'm going to show you once we go back to the computer, I want to show you that project, but since I have the tile here, this tile is very interesting because since it's not fire, it's all pigment, it's, um, pigment press in a mold and it's a project that I did with uh, local craft people so it really involved the community and the traditions they work with. And the, in this wall, let me see if I can put the whole thing here. Yeah. Uh, I have an ongoing project based on the myth of El Dorado and it's not finished it, like it's been going on for years and it gets i get uh to add more pieces as uh the time passes so this is a mixed media work on myler it's kind of hard to see with the reflections so it has like a uh, golden paint enamel and gold leaf and then we have some wire mesh pieces and cast bronze and fabric and some weaving on the wall and then the big a uh, piece that it's very high. I'm going to go back. Uh, I really like the way when I hang drawings, it's very important for me the location. So this one, it's playing with that other window. And also it brings the sun in the morning that comes from the opposite wall. It reflects on that piece and it uh, illuminates the space. So I'm going to go to another part now. So you can see some drawings, storage. And these are the ocean drawings. It's a series of eight drawings that I did over like three or four years and if you I'm going to get close so you can see a detail so you can see every stroke every line is a stroke with a pen um, with a pencil and 
some parts, the parts that are darker, had many, many layers. So it's almost like a meditation piece. It's a very slow um, process. Karen, can you talk a little bit about working on vellum and the difference between working on a vellum drawing as opposed to just working on a paper? Oh, sure. A tremendous amount of luminosity to the work. Well, vellum is amazing. I love vellum. Uh, not only because of the way the light works on it. Vellum, um, my, this is Myler. Um, is, uh, it's like a film but it has a treatment uh, that allows you to draw and paint also. Uh, you can use wet techniques on, on Myler. And I started working with this technique on vellum and vellum is 100% organic. And it's a very tricky material. It's, it, I love to work on that too, but it's, uh, you have to be very careful with the humidity. So at that point I was working on very big uh, wall hanging pieces uh, in vellum and the change with the humidity, the change in size was so big. That was not, in, no, it was almost impossible to hang it because you would hang it very um, stretch. And then with the humidity in the air, it would buckle. So, so these other drawings are also in Myler. It's the same material. And these are um, part of a series of fragments of a mountain. And we can, let me get close to frame one. So in these drawings, I was investigating the passage of time. And um, we can see the years of erosions on the rock and on also the cavities, how we would hold humidity or debris. So we can really see the, the passing of time. And also it's a series of seven drawings and I'm going to show some of them at Guild Hall. Um, I'm going to show how they are when you are closer. So here you can see the pencil. So all this work on, on Myler is extremely so slow, but I think it's, it's very, I hope that process, it's been real in, in the work. So it's slow and it needs time also to, to be observed. So. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my studio and to the main studio. And I'm going to show the, the piece in Mexico, and then we can open to, to questions. So, so this is the Chihuahua Desert, and this is the oasis. Uh, it's all concrete from the outside. This is an image of the top of the piece. It's an extraordinary, beautiful place. Uh, the nights there are incredible. There's no artificial light anywhere close, so you can almost see the curvature of the, of the sky. And so these are like stainless steel tubes that perforate the piece on the roof and on the sides of the, the walls that are not underground. And when you get closer, you go down. Here is the entrance to the stairs. You go down and you enter this space. And this is the main space inside the piece. And this is the, you can see here, the tile that I showed you before. So these uh, are the perforations where the stainless steel tubes are. And this is um, 
an optical effect that is produced when the light uh, reflects on, on, on the metal. And I knew I was going to get these projections of the, the light coming from the ceiling, but I never imagined these kind of lens watery uh, effects. So you are inside the space, uh, the light is dim comparing to the harshness of the light outside in the desert. Also, it's colder, the temperature, because you went down, you are underground, part of the structure is underground. And then you look at the desert. Uh, these are looking through the perforations, but you look through uh, from this blue environment. So the contrast between the inside and the outside is very strong. And that's it. Um, so I don't know if you have any questions about the, the, the work that I show or any other questions. Yes, we have some questions coming in through the chat. Okay. The first one we have is from Kristen Everstadt. Are these patterns inspired by what you find in nature? Do you work exclusively in light? Well, yes, some are. Um, uh, the ones in, in clay, maybe it's more direct, but also the, the patterns overall, uh, they start usually from a piece of lace and lace was created by observation of nature. If you go back in history, lace was uh, super valuable in, in the 17th century. Uh, it was more valuable than gold. Um, so uh, they even created um, greenhouses for growing exotic plants that um, then they could use for making of lace. So when I start with a piece of lace, I basically, I work, um, I work with, uh, with nature. It's just one step removed because it was somebody else working from nature and doing a pattern, and then I work from that. So, um, so the answer is yes. In a way, it's, it's, it comes from nature. Uh, kind Not of only a... that, but also like the process of growth, the idea of growth in nature. It's very related to the way I work with the patterns. A uh, question that kind of goes along with that is, would you like to bronze the wall pieces? And if so, would, what would the lace be? Can you say that again? I, I, I couldn't hear you. Would you like to bronze the wall pieces? And if so, what would the glaze be? Bronze? Bronze. No. No. Uh, no. <laughs> no, it's very, because I mentioned the importance of the wall, like the wall is part of the piece. So it's, it's very important that the piece uh, remains, uh, remains white. So it's not like I painted white. This is the color of the materials. Usually I don't work. I don't uh, transform the materials uh, or paint or, or dye. I work with whatever I work is the, the, the way the material is. Um, so for me, it's very important that these pieces uh, remain the main the same color as the wall because then the wall could be part of it you briefly uh, mentioned uh, meditation on the mylar pieces and one question is in seeing your work in process i'm reminded of eastern meditations and mantras in this geometric design how are the ideas genre part of your practice well, it's not like really, um, when I say meditation is, um, I don't meditate. Uh, I think my meditation is being in my studio, but like it reminds me that because of the, how monotonous and repetitive the, the action is. So basically that takes over, takes over the way you are thinking or 
So, but it's not like it's an active meditation practice. Uh, do chance procedures play a role in your composition, the layout or relationship of each other? And I ask because the organic forms starting out on the floor make it seem like gravity might factor in. Yeah, chance does play a part. Uh, usually I start with a very um, definite idea uh, about what I want the piece to look and I start working on the floor or on a table and and then it has to go through different process like it has to go some pieces particularly the clay pieces have to uh, be fired so um, there's a, a, a lapse in time until I, I get to hang it uh, so when I get those pieces and I hang it, usually it never works. So there I have to start basically, I will say from scratch, but that's where chance plays a role because I start moving things around. If I have two pieces, there's a dialogue between those two pieces that influence each one piece or the other. Sometimes I think I need a piece that belongs to the neighbor. So it goes to from there. So chance to play uh, a big part. Though it's a very planned process. It has, to, it has so many steps that you have to follow for these pieces. It's not like uh, completely spontaneous because of the technique and, but things, get transformed constantly and usually a piece takes me either it depends but it could take anywhere from three three months to a year or more not because i'm working constantly there but like it, it's it's been transformed um this comes from estralita brodsky love seeing the El Dorado series, seeing the interplay between landscape and organic weavings instead of strict grid, have a regular weft, weft slash warp that see to be on verge of coming apart. Can you talk about the relationship between nature and basic forms? Basic forms. Um, well, nature, like uh, as I was talking before in the lace pieces, usually doesn't come for me from direct observation. It's not like I do a sketch from a plan, but it's more about the perception of nature, how our body reacts to nature, to it, whether it's water, whether it's altitude, whether it's um, reflection, like the idea of a mirage. That's what is something that is present in the gold, uh, in the El Dorado. So nature is present, but it's more like an evocation of nature. And, and I think it's like a search of ways to represent nature. Like how could you represent nature without um, almost naming it? No? So it's more about the experience. Karen, can you tell us a little bit about you've studied you studied architecture, and how does that influence the work that you're doing now? Um, what are the correlations, and what would you say are the disadvantages of having a background in architecture? Well, uh, I don't see any disadvantages. Uh, I love architecture, uh, and. Though it's very different than what I'm doing now, I think it has to do with the way we move in space. So I think that's something that it travels with me wherever I go uh, in terms of different disciplines. And it made my practice um, more multidisciplinary. I don't think I could have done the project I did in, in the Chihuahua Desert if I were not trained as an architect. And, um, and I love the whole process of doing the construction drawings and working with the craft people doing the tiles and the modulation of the piece. Um, I remember it was a very complicated 
project because um, I couldn't go there to supervise the construction that often and it had to be very precisely built because that tile had to be, I was telling the, the builder over the phone over and over again, Mauro, this is not a bathroom. We cannot cut the tile. So everything had to be perfectly measured because from the foundation up, the tile had to be whole. And that was very important for me. And then not only that, but the tiles, they start on the floor and they go up the wall and they go up the ceiling and they go back the wall and they have to align. So it was a very complicated project. And, uh, but in Mexico, you have amazing craft people and, and it came out really well. And, but I think that I couldn't have done it or even think about it if I were not, uh, if without my background in architecture. And in terms of the work, I, my other work, uh, I think it's about the perception of space and how we move in space and how what we build, build affect us, how we move and perceive things. Absolutely. Some of the pieces you have done um, have been not quite like the wall piece behind you, but have been bronzed for the, ex the exterior of the buildings. Do you ever see a piece like behind you, totally done in bronze, glazed in white, in white, you know, glaze with a white glaze on it, so that it could be on the exterior of a building, so that that would affect both the interior and the exterior spaces? Well, I never had the opportunity to do that. Uh... It might work, I don't know. It's hard for me to say until I see the space. That's another thing. It, it, my work is very site specific and I do like to respond to what's around me. So I will need to see what type of wall it is, how the light plays, how you arrive to that place. Um, and then, yes, I mean, this material is not bad for outside. The, the material that I use for the overall pattern, that part, um, that it was developed to uh, do ornamentation or fix facades. Uh, so it is for outdoors. Um, the ceramic is trickier. It could be outside, but not in this weather uh, because of the ice uh, would expand it and, and it would crack the pieces. So, but in my work, we'll see. <laughs> Well, this was really so wonderful, Karen. Thank you so much for sharing so much and letting us know so much about the work and your inspiration behind it and the techniques that you've used. I can't wait to have the exhibition at Guild Hall, and I know that everyone here will just, we, we can't wait to see it in person. So I'm really, really thrilled about that opportunity. I'm sorry, I'm blanking out here on the screen. I don't know what just happened. <laughs> So thank you so much. And um, uh, does Lita and Andrew want to say a thank you too? Yeah, I, I just want to thank everyone who joined us and, and Karen. Um, we look forward to having you at Guild Hall in 2021. And, um, and also, you know, I think that uh, that the, the work you, we didn't get to, but you also sometimes make wearable work as well. And that will be interesting to talk about at a later date. Okay, great. Terrific, thank you everyone. Thank you to our um, board and the chairmen and the director's circle and our contemporaries for joining us and our special guests. Thank you everyone.